All right, we have a big election coming up November 8th. Huge midterms around the country, but also really big races here in Minnesota. And John Croman's been covering it all <laughs> for CARE 11. Okay, so John, fill us in a little bit. Uh, we have these huge races. Probably the biggest one that everyone's going to vote on here is the governor's race. That's right. Uh, the polls have been tightening a little mm -hmm. bit. So what can we expect in this race? I think it'll stay tight till the end, and it'll get tighter because those undecided voters will start coming in. Um, and, you know, the governor has been a leader through a really tough time, you know, crisis on top of crisis on top of crisis. Um, so you've got that um, working against him. Um, you know, his, he's been, you know, had a certain line of attack against Scott Jensen related to Jensen's uh, stance on abortion um, and statements he's made about abortion in the past. And whether that becomes or remains a salient issue with enough voters, I guess, remains to be seen. But um, so I think that one's going to be tight. Um, and, you know, the, the governor has been attacked on his response to the riots. Feeding our future uh, fraud mm -hmm. scandal, um, also uh, closing schools and businesses and churches during the COVID pandemic, and so you got that. The governor's come back against uh, Scott Jensen for some of the uh, conspiracy theories he promoted, such as the government um, inflating death toll during COVID and things like that, and also uh, uh, Jensen trying to or, or saying he'd like to eliminate the state income tax, which would like strip. $15 billion a year out of the state budget, which is something they'd have to either <laughs> drastically cut spending or do something to replace that. So you've got yeah. that, that's kind of the dynamics there. But I think, you know, the governor recognizes that he can't just, you know, be complacent about that, that Jensen is a legitimate, credible um, contender in this race. You know, I'm wondering, we're talking about all of these issues, and what do we know from polling? I mean, we've done polls at CARE 11, we've seen other ones about what issues are actually landing and what kind of mm matter to Minnesotans because it's clear that Tim Walls has wanted to talk about abortion. Right. That has been a Democratic strategy throughout the whole midterms. Mm -hmm. It's clear that Scott Jensen wants not to talk about that. Right. Right. He wants to talk about crime, it right. seems like right. has been his strategy. So what do we know about what voters actually want to hear? Well, it's interesting because our own poll that we did with the Star Tribune and NPR um, showed that the economy was the top issue. If mm -hmm. People were asked to just name one issue. I mean, we talked to some of the people who took part in the poll and they said it was really hard to decide because they see all the issues is kind of linked and interwoven. Um, but economy, you know, inflation, gas prices, things like that was top. Number two was crime. And what was interesting to me is that even in low crime areas, Republicans think crime is a big problem. And so I don't know if that's because of messaging or because they typically would go to the Twin Cities to visit and now they say they're afraid to go to the mm -hmm. Twin Cities, things like that. So there's that. And then number three was abortion. And everything else, education, climate, uh, you know, energy, all that stuff was below. Um, okay. A lot of those top three issues. So those are the th issues they're focusing right. on. That does seem to be what people care about. Uh, all right. So Attorney General is probably, as is, is I've seen with polling at least, the tightest of the statewide exactly. races. I mean, that is a, a really tight race for Keith Ellison, who's trying to retain his seat. Right. And it's interesting because the Attorney General's job, as you know, is generally about civil lawsuits. It's mm -hmm. consumer protection actions. It's going after bad players uh, in the consumer world and in the business world generally. Um, but the race has now become about um, the criminal prosecution role of the Attorney General's office. And you've got uh, his opponent, Jim Schultz, Republican opponent, uh, basically saying that uh, um, Keith Ellison has failed to protect people and it hasn't made public safety enough of an issue. And, and you know, Ellison has basically said, you know, we have a really small uh, staff of prosecutors, but we're getting the work done. We're helping local people, local attorney, yeah. county attorneys. Um, the, the, the liability for Ellison in this with Republicans is that he did endorse question number two. I mean, he has no control over the Minneapolis Police Department or Minneapolis Police budgets, but he endorsed ballot question two, which would have replaced the MPD, and that has created a major liability for him with the police groups. The police groups have now endorsed Jim Schultz. And it seems like we've had all of these proxy races <laughs> around question two. The Minneapolis mayor's race right. eventually was about question exactly. two. But you know, it's funny, because you and I, we cover the attorney general's office. So we know that their role in criminal prosecution really isn't that big right. in Minnesota. A, a, a local county attorney needs to ask them mm -hmm. to come in to prosecute they, a murder case. But do you think most Minnesotans know that or do nope. they do you think that they think, OK, attorney general, top cop, top cop. This that, is about that, crime. Exactly. That label top cop makes you think that the job is about crime. 
And this is an advantage for the Republicans because now they can show the images mm -hmm. of Minneapolis burning and try to link Keith Ellison to that. Um, and I mean, Ellison was involved in some really high profile prosecutions because uh, the Chauvin trial and the Kim Potter trial, the AG's office led that, but it's mainly a team of local prosecutors helping with that. Um, and, and Jim Schultz has made, and some Republicans, Scott Jensen also, has made an issue of the prosecution of Kim Potter. They thought mm -hmm. that she was charged with a crime that didn't fit what happened uh, with Dante Wright. And in fact, in the latest debate, Jim Schultz said that he would, you know, move to try to pardon uh, Kim Potter, you know, as soon as he got into office, um, he'd be a member of the pardons board, one of the mm -hmm. three members, so he would support okay. that. Yeah. So that would actually be something he could that is something take he, action he, on. He could take action on if there's a unanimous vote. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, we, you, they talk about these specific cases, about these specific policies, but do you think in a lot of this it comes down to how Minnesotans feel? Do well, I feel safe? Do I feel <laughs> no, secure? No, that, that's it. I mean, it, it, it goes all the way back to the Ronald Reagan question. Mm -hmm. Do you feel better off than you did four years ago? And it's, a lot of it is gut. You might be angry, and you know we know the Republican ad makers are experts. They're artists when it comes to reminding people what they need to be angry about. But <laughs> the question is, what? How do you translate that into action that will fix the problems mm -hmm. that you're angry about? Um, and you know the Republicans have been kind of sh kind of short on answers in terms of what they would do to fix mm -hmm. these things. It's mainly what they would not do. They would not repeat the mistakes of Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, and people on the, on the Democratic side. Well, anytime you have an incumbent, I mean, yeah. rightfully so, it is sort of a referendum on right. what right. kind of job did they do? Exactly. Do, you, do you think they did a good yeah. job? All right, Congressional District 2. Mm. And for those who don't know, Congressional District 2 is, uh, it cuts a swath of the southern metro, far south metro, right. and then goes into more rural areas That's as right. you head down to St. Peter. So that is one of the most expensive races mm -hmm. and one of the most closely watched races in the country right. in Congress. Why? It's one of the very few competitive congressional districts. A lot of the districts, just because of the way districts are drawn and gerrymandering and other things, a lot of districts aren't competitive. It's you know they they basically are are you know geared to be an advantage for the incumbent. This is one of those that is wide open. Anybody can win it. And the shape of the district has changed too because of redistricting. Uh, it's taking in an area directly south of the Twin Cities that uh, wasn't originally in Angie Craig's mm -hmm. district and it's more of a Republican area. So that gives the Republicans, you know, this this hope that they can flip it back to red. It was a red district. It was always a Republican district for a long time. And then Angie Craig flipped it in 2018. Um, it barely won re-election against Tyler Kistner in 2020. And then you have like the kind of the wild card of the marijuana candidate who's in the race. And in this case, the marijuana candidate is dead, but is still polling at 5%. But this is the second Mm -hmm. election in a row that that has happened. Yeah, the, the Minnesota, Reform Minnesota Now candidate has has died in both election cycles. And last time there was a lawsuit to try to force, mm -hmm. um, a, there, well, first there was a ruling by the Secretary of State to say, we're going to have to reschedule the election. We're going to have to uh, do a new election in February. And then uh, Andrew Craig's campaign sued and, and, and succeeded in federal court. And federal court ruled that, no, the state can't, change this. Uh, this uh, law doesn't allow it. So they had to go ahead and have the election when it was scheduled. And that time, that's why they're not even trying to try to, to redo it this year. In fact, you can't even send the people who already voted absentee, you can't send them a, a new slate, a new ballot. Wow. Yeah. And that is razor thin, that right, race. Right. And I mean, right, that's a little bit of a microcosm of what we're seeing around the country. Typically, the president's party loses seats right. in a midterm and certainly President Biden isn't the most popular exactly. incumbent, and so I imagine that, that that's right. what Angie Craig's challenger is trying to do, exactly. is try and saddle her with that. Right. He's tapping into inflation. Mm -hmm. um, he's claiming that Biden's infrastructure spending plans have caused inflation, which that, that's not really provable um, because the infrastructure spending is happening over 10 years. None of it's happened in Minnesota yet because we haven't given the matching funds. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so the money that that's been approved by Biden has, isn't really being spent in this state, so it can't really be blamed for inflation in this state. Mm -hmm. But that's another thing, as you said, the voters would not know that they just they know they're paying a lot more. They're angry about it. They need someone to blame, and there are all these ads telling them, "Here's here's who to blame." Here's who to blame. Not supply chain, not COVID, not you know mm -hmm. Russia invading Ukraine. None of that stuff. It's all. <laughs> 
right. Joe Biden did this. So, so that gives uh, Kissner and, and other Republicans an advantage. So uh, Angie Craig then, of course, is fighting back by just trying to say she's signed on to a lot of bipartisan common sense bills. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's you know, been supported by business groups, farm groups, and she's got the endorsement of the statewide police group. Um, the MPPOA has endorsed Angie Craig in this cycle after endorsing Kistner in the last election. So yeah. she's that's got rare. that. That's, that's rare. I mean, usually, at least in recent memory, police groups have always endorsed exactly. Republicans, yeah. especially here in Minnesota. All right, so I want to get to one more big race that people are going to be watching, and this really impacts people in Hennepin County because there's all these concerns about crime mm -hmm. and our county attorney, that is an office, you talk about the attorney general's office and what they can or can't do. The county attorney's office, this is what they do. They right. prosecute violent crime. They have a lot of say over bail, over things like that. So these are distinct policy differences that exactly. we have in this race between Martha Holton Dimmick and Mary Moriarty. So talk about the, the real distinct choice people have here. Well, you've got Mary, who has been a lifetime public defender, her mm -hmm. whole career has been in public defense, defending people. She um, got into some hot water with her superiors for just making public statements about how the system is tilted against people of color and low-income people, and uh, and that justice in you know economic standing does affect your your accessibility to justice in this country. And so she got into some hot water there, and you know she ended up being forced out of her job and then suing, and they made a settlement. So you got that. So you know she she's getting criticized for wanting to um, side too much with defendants, mm -hmm. even though uh, she does have more experience managing a huge staff than Martha Holden Demick. Martha Holden Demick uh, started out as a nurse, uh, went to law school at night, became a lawyer, became a prosecutor in Hennepin County, then became a Hennepin County judge. She lives on the north side, just kind of on the edge between the North Minneapolis and Golden Valley. Um, but she's, you know, feels like she's in a community that's very impacted by crime and can speak firsthand about how crime has has made life really harder for people up there and made things made things put people on edge essentially. So she's got that, and, and she's you know got the def the support of Don Samuels, who was against Question mm -hmm. Two and almost almost uh, um, beat Ilhan Omar in the primary, also over the same issues, crime, mm -hmm. and uh, and just you know support for police. And so you've got that, and you know Mary Moriarty is kind of going out of her way now to say I am totally about public safety. Public safety is number one. Um, you know, and Martha Holden, and so, I mean, this one's gonna be good. It really just depends on, you know, they won in a, they, they prevail in a, in a seven-way race. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how the people who voted for those other five candidates spread out. Shake out. It's another this. one of those question two proxies, exactly, essentially. Exactly. And But I think the interesting difference is um, in, you talk about the Don Samuels, Ilhan Omar race. Right? I mean, that was a swath of Hennepin County that included the city of Minneapolis, right. basically, a handful. I mean, this is going to include Minnetonka, Wyzetta, right. some more perhaps conservative areas of Hennepin County that we didn't see. Exactly. It's a really good, very one. good point, Lauren. And then it's, it's I mean, the, uh, District 5 includes, you know, some of the first ring suburbs, mm -hmm. but does not include large areas of Hennepin County that generally would vote Republican, more exurban areas. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, well this is really interesting. Thank you, John. You're always just full of knowledge <laughs> about these things. I don't know how you keep it all straight because you're covering all of these stories all the time. Here's what I do know. I will be willing to bet that at least on some of these laces, races, it might be a late night oh, on yeah. November 8th. Yeah, it sure will be. And I mean, even the Secretary of State's race, uh, where the, the Republican challenger to Steve Simon says she's she's not even yet ready to accept the results of this election um, because even though the rules have changed, I mean, she said mm -hmm. she doesn't trust the last election because the, the rules were changed for COVID. But this time we're back to the original rules. You know, you yeah. need a witness signature, advocacy ballot and all that stuff. And she's still wa wanting to see how the votes are counted mm -hmm. before she'll commit to it. So yeah, so that could be, that could be another late night thing. And you know, we, you know, it, it's one of those things where I don't think we'll have answers to a lot of these races and in, you know, for, you know, me, I cover the state capitol, and the control of the legislature is another big one. Huge, uh, and we didn't yeah, even touch yeah, well, on that, but well, that is huge. Minnesota is the only divided legislature right. in the whole country, which just astonishes me. It just shows, I think, the unique political climate yes. in Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, very purple state, and you can have, that's why you can, the Republicans have not won a statewide race here since 2006, when Governor Plenty won re-election. Um, and, and so they really want to win one of these statewide races, but the legislature control keeps switching back and forth, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just, you know, part of it's because the terms 
don't line up, yeah. you know? So it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy thing. So we're going to be watching that really carefully, too, on election night because, uh, you know, depending on who, who wins the governor's race, who wins mm -hmm. the legislature is going to be very critical. Wow. Well, you guys, we will be having coverage, obviously, on CARE 11 throughout the night, but you can also catch us. We're going to be going wall-to-wall -wall with local races on CARE 11 Plus. So if you want to hear more about what's happening in some of our congressional districts, make sure to be following us throughout the night here, too, and online. Thanks, John. Thank you.